Danny, very good morning to you. Good morning, Mike. This is the first morning, I think, we've woken up and there hasn't really been anything terrible that happened overnight. So I don't know whether that's a good thing uh, or whether it's just a blip, really. Well, it's obviously a good thing that there wasn't any trouble overnight. I think there's a lot of concern about what happened, what might happen tonight because of this uh, list of uh, immigration law centres, immigration offices and so on that has been circulating. Uh, I've seen a list, I think, of around 40 uh, premises across the country uh, and a sort of call to action by the far right. So that is a real concern. But, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's possible that the police will be more prepared than they were at the start of last week, when I think the first couple of nights, I think they were a bit slow uh, to act on the intelligence that they may have had, or perhaps they didn't have the intelligence and didn't get onto the streets in sufficient numbers, because it's having police in sufficient numbers, in big numbers, um, outnumbering the number of people who come intent on violence that will make the difference, I think, ultimately in this. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no doubt that some of the earlier um, situations, both in Southport and uh, in some ways in Rotherham, uh, at the beginning, the police didn't seem to have as many people as they should have had, and they didn't seem to be really prepared for what was happening as well. But do you think there's been an effect on whoever's doing this because of the way that arrests have been made um, and people have been sort of put through a court system quite quickly? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see that tonight, Mike, I think. Um, we'll see whether that has had an impact. I mean, I sincerely hope it, it has. I'm very, I was very pleased yesterday that we saw cases being processed in the courts. We saw people being remanded into custody, i.e. being held in, in prison cells while they await um, their hearings or their sentences, and we saw uh, some people being sentenced already by magistrates. That's that's that was really good and really positive thing because it sends out a strong message. My worry is uh, that it's a, a little bit late. It should have happened towards the end of last week. I'm not sure why uh, some of these prosecutions and some of the cases weren't being uh, fast tracked. Uh, by Thursday or Friday or even over the weekend. It feels like the system just took a while to crank up and it was clear, and one of the biggest lessons from the 2011 riots, one of the biggest lessons was that you have to get the cases processed in the courts really, really fast. Firstly, to take the troublemakers away from the streets and secondly, to send out the signal of firm and swift justice. Yeah, I think that's a, probably a, a, a decent point to make. The trouble, I suppose, is that a lot of people are still feeling as though the police are not treating everybody equally. And there's an interesting piece of footage I want to show you now from the West Midlands Police, Superintendent Emlyn Richards, explaining why there weren't any police at a particular gathering and the disorder that happened in Birmingham the other night. Because we were aware through intelligence that there was a potential protest through that misinformation yesterday, we had the opportunity to meet with community leaders, with business leaders prior to that event to kind of understand the style of policing that we needed to deliver during the course of that operation. So we knew that there was going to be a large amount of people out on that counter protest. We knew who the vast majority of those people were. We'd had uh, conversations in terms of uh, what that was likely to look like. And so our policing response was commensurate to that intelligence and the information that we'd held with our partners and communities prior to that event taking place. What I would say is that the vast majority of people that attended that protest yesterday did so law-abidingly and they did it with the right intentions. There were just a small minority of people that attended there and were intent on causing either criminality, disorder or fear within our communities. I mean, it's quite a bizarre statement, that, isn't it? Because here you've got a guy saying, well, there was some disorder, but we sort of left it alone because there wasn't much of it um, and most of the people were law-abiding. You know, it's a bit like when they said uh, that BLM marches were mostly peaceful, even though 27 police officers ended up in hospital. And so, you know, the accusations of two-tier policing will continue. Well, it's certainly the optics around it don't look good. Um, I, I can understand that... You know, the, the, the police do this all the time. Um, well, that's know, why people are unhappy with it. Yeah, but what, what, if I can just finish your point. The, the police in London do this all the time with protests, with genuine protests, um, you know, liaising with, with demonstrators, with the people who are leading the process, asking them where they're going to go, how many people, and then they adopt the policing tactics to suit 
uh, the, the style of the protest. That happens all the time, Mike. Um, but what we had here, and that's presumably what they were doing here, but what we have here is a rather different situation. And I think perhaps police sort of misunderstood the context around it, yeah. how it would look in terms of, you know, uh, other uh, uh, other demonstrations, other which have turned violent very, very quickly and have probably sort of misinterpreted the way that would look. Standing aside, if this had been some protest that had taken place in isolation, then that may well have been the right sort of tactic to adopt. But um, it seems as though it wasn't correct in this particular situation. And it has given rise to this concern of two-tier policing. Um, I'm not sure that's a label that's justified, but certainly I can see why some people uh, would argue that it is too typical. Yeah, I mean, there's a quote here for, uh, in one of the papers from <coughs> Naveed Sadiq, a respected figure in the local Muslim community, um, who said he rushed to the scene when he found out that his pub was being attacked and a guy was being beaten up. Um, the guy who was Sean McDonough, is his name, has apparently suffered a torn liver. Um, but he said he'd come from a meeting hosted by police in Bordesley Green to provide reassurance to the Muslim community and he phoned the police officer that he met there to say there was violence going on uh, and he was assured by the police nothing was happening and so they didn't even go after he called them and he says they're only two minutes away but they just didn't come well i mean if if that's right that's obviously you know really really poor response um, and that will have to be looked into i think you will find that hopefully when these um riots uh, calm down and hopefully that won't take too many more days uh, there will be a review of all the policing and all the tactics that we used. Um, and some of it will be shown to be, uh, I am sure, um, falling short in some areas. Um, but, you know, these are these are fast moving situations for the police. It's very easy for us to be armchair critics uh, sitting in the comfort of our uh, studios or our living rooms uh, saying what should and shouldn't happen. Yes. Uh, given particular yeah, situations. no, I agree with that. And I, th I think it, it is easy to do that. But equally, by the same token, it seems m madness to not have any police in, in situations which are clearly, you know, gatherings which could get out of control. Even if they had a small police presence, they would have had a police presence. Because let's not forget, you know, media were attacked as well. Uh, there was a Sky News reporter um, who was kind of harassed. They had to switch off their camera. Uh, the people who were harassing and then tried to s stab the uh, uh, the tyres of a Sky um, News truck. You know, it wasn't a nice situation at all. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, it looks like the police have got it wrong in this particular situation. Um, but equally, I would say they, you know, they also weren't on the streets in enough numbers uh, last week. Um, when some of the violence was absolutely appalling and, mm. and got out of hand. So I'm, I'm not sure the label of two-tier policing is right, but I agree with you that on this occasion in Birmingham, um, they should have had more of a presence. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it is absolutely right that there is two-tier policing. I think that particularly uh, does actually show it. But let me ask you this question. You used to work with uh, Yvette Cooper when she was Shadow Home Secretary. Um, have a look at this. Like many of like many of our viewers will have done at home uh, since those terrible killings in Southport, there have been identifiable individuals on social media who have been inciting not just riot, but violence. They've been using racist language. They've been using falsehoods about what happened in Southport. This is, uh, this is happening on the social media platforms. What can be done, what should be done now by the social media companies and the police and the government to stop this happening because it's been happening for a week. Well, you're right, Ed, that we have seen these, uh, the, uh, what things that are appearing online that are clearly criminal, that social media has put rocket boosters under the far-right extremist organisation and also some of the violence that we have seen organising some of the violence. Now, a lot of people quite rightly are saying, you know, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Husband interviewing wife, they don't actually bother to mention that they're married. Uh, what did you make of that? It's a bit of an odd look. It um, is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she, uh, she might as well have said, hi, darling, haven't seen you since we had toast and tea together over the breakfast table, um, but let's talk about, you know, the serious problem of writing. I mean, surely ITV should have seen that coming and gone, you know, maybe, Ed, you should sit this one out. Uh, I think it's an issue for ITV, and I don't understand why ITV uh, didn't just um, do the interview with the co-presenter rather than with yeah. Ed. Um, that's 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 my own view about it. I mean, I think there's a lot more serious and important things to discuss uh, than the nature of 
you know, a, one particular interview. Uh, on oh, there TV. are, but we do everything here, Danny. As you know, we do we do all stories here. We do, we yep. know, we do we cover the whole gamut, which is why people love the show because we don't just stick to one narrow definition of what is going on and what the trouble is. Because I'm going to ask you another question before I let you go. You know, this has been a nightmare start for Labour. They've come in, uh, Keir Starmer, with a huge majority, um, but a small percentage of the vote. He's come in with a huge level of popularity, and he's gone from a 16-point approval rating down to a three uh, within a couple of weeks. I think you know. To be honest, Mike, um, you know, w w working working for Yvette Cooper and for Labour before the election, I think everyone was aware uh, that if they were elected, they would face huge issues and problems uh, very quickly uh, in government. You've got some people around the cabinet table who've been in government before, who know how difficult it is. Yvette Cooper is one of them. Um, so they were aware, certainly, of the problems that uh, have been left by the Conservatives. Um, you know, particularly uh, around small boats, uh, prisons uh, and the economy. Uh, and they knew that there would be events and incidents that would happen very quickly that would really test them. I'm not saying that they, were, they would be thinking they'd have to deal with riots within a month. Um, but obviously any government is tested, um, you know, pretty early on these days. Um, and I don't think they'll be too worried at the moment about approval ratings and poll ratings and the rest of it. At the moment, the challenge is to, you know, is to manage this situation, to get the police um, and the courts, criminal justice system working together properly and to try and bring some order to the streets. Yes, and I mean, that's never going to be easy for them. Danny, thanks very much indeed. Danny Shaw, the uh, policing crime commentator, talking uh, to us there about all the things that have been happening this week.